Yep, to the cloud. There it goes. All right, we are on the record. Good. Well, welcome everyone to the um, school budget Q and A uh, meeting tonight. This is our second of five scheduled um, school budget workshops before we get to the final meeting where we vote on the budget. Thank you everyone for um, sending along your questions to the administrators and um, uh, met this morning. And I think the process tonight is we are gonna let, if there's anyone who has any comments from the public um, up to 10 minutes, just at the beginning. And if we get through the answers, we'll have time at this, for the school board members at the end, sort of how we thought this might go. So we could let the administrators give their presentations on the questions. Um, so jot some questions down if you have follow-ups on those, but um, we think that would make, be the best way forward. And then uh, we'll have a hard stop at 8.30 assuming we go that long. Um, and then next week um, we'll continue with this and we're gonna, at this point, the plan is to go any more follow-up questions that may have come up that the administrators didn't have answers to um, that you may have during our time, they'll, they'll come back with that. And also um, Marcy is gonna plan to go in a little more depth AD 379 and also um, the fund balance and some options we have. So that we're gonna get into a little bit more of that kind of in depth next week. Um, before we get into citizen comments, I just wanna read our goals, just remind ourselves like we do every time. Um, the first is maintaining and improving high quality of education for every student. Careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. Support the strategic plan goals and clear and continual communication throughout the budget process. Um, and to that end, I would just note that we continue to, as we have in the past and Elizabeth and others before me started a meeting with um, the town chair of the town council and the budget chair and the town manager this morning and we continue those on a monthly basis to ensure clear communication on that end along with Heather and myself. Um, so at this point if there's anyone um, in the meeting from the public who'd like to speak if, um, we're going to give two minutes and we'll have a 10 minute um, time frame overall. If you'd like to speak just raise your hand and we'll let you in. Not seeing any. Give it another minute just to make sure our attendee. Okay. Don't think we're gonna have anyone. So moving right along, we're gonna go to Jason Mangerides um, from Punco with the questions that we sent along. Great, thank you, Phil. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. So thank you for the questions. Um, for these follow-up questions and I, hopefully I will um, do a thorough job of answering for the, them. And um, I, my document, I'm sure you all have this document in front of you um, and it's titled everything, all the answers are on this document titled Pond Cove School School Board Budget Questions and Answers. And so we've got five pages. So I'm not going to like go over everything verbatim but try to hit the points and then please feel free to ask follow-up questions. Uh, so first question, um, with regards to the proposed math interventionist position, is, is the proposed position permanent? And the answer is yes, um, that I propose this to be a permanent position, not just a one year. And the next question, how will it fit into Pond Cove's RTI model? I'd like to thank um, Debbie Butterworth, our um, our current math interventionist for um, helping put this information together. Um, is, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to read it, but uh, I'm going to kind of skim through the beginning. Um, Debbie paints a picture of a history that um, comes before my time of um, starting up a, a math intervention program at Pond Cove through a SEAF grant. Um, and this is something that she has been very passionate about for years. Um, so uh, starting that up and then just going on to current day, we have one math interventionist position and uh, to compare it to our literacy supports, we have three literacy um, intervention specialist positions. So we have the one. So um, this is something that my staff and, and, and I've been talking about with them for the, for the past three and a half years about um, building more capacity in, in our um, RTI system in the area of math. 
So um, if you go, if you go to the table, if you kind of like turn to the second page of this document and it says fall 2020 student NWA math scores, um, which is, it's a title that's underlined. Then below that there's a table and it shows in here, we've outlined some numbers. Um, so if you look at the table, where you see it says red and yellow. These are students who fell below the benchmark in, in, this, in this measurement in NWEA scores in math. And students that are um, in red are definitely in need. Um, um, we're finding of tier three support, which would be our most intense support. And that would be provided by an intervention specialist teacher, which is um, the, the position I'm proposing, not to be confused with an RTI educational technician. <clears throat> so our teachers, which Debbie is, one, is the one we have now, they provide like intense focus and in, in they're highly trained in, in providing math support. So you could see, if you just, you can interpret the table. Um, our RTI math teacher would provide all the tier three support and help oversee all the tier two support being provided by the educational technicians who provide tier two in math. So you can see where it says total needing support tier two and three. Um, and this is based on this year's data, 23 first graders, 19 second graders, 23 third graders, 24 fourth graders. And, and so, of, so of all those kids, um, 24 of those would require tier three support. And um, that level of intensity of support is typically four or five days a week for 30 minutes a day. So to provide that level of support, it takes a lot of time from one person's schedule. Uh, and so these numbers kind of outline the need to, to provide a high level of support to all who need it and help oversee and guide the instruction provided by ed techs we feel like that we easily could utilize two people um, for this. So it goes back, this is just a little bit of data pointing out uh, what I mentioned the last meeting that um, we feel that we're under implemented in the, that intense level of math support. Um, I, at this point, I think I'd move on from that question and then just see if anyone has a follow-up after. So question two, um, permanent substitute position. And you folks pointed out it's currently paid with COVID funds. And the question is, do I foresee um, similar needs for subs? And so my answer is that ironically, like our needs for subs this year, um, it, our need for subs is much, much lower than typical in a typical year. Um, so our, our, um, attendance rates are higher for staff. And I believe that the, um, and also in order to find subs, I think the high, high rate of pay through COVID is, is enabling us to, to secure subs quite easily and, and, and maintain and have the same folks come back, um, really high quality subs coming back. Um, a typical year of covering classrooms is a constant struggle every day. Uh, so I anticipate much higher need for the long-term sub position in the future than I do even this year. Um, although it's been very important this year, it's, it's, um, we've used that sub every day, uh, but still the need is nowhere near, um, not even 50%. Um, I don't even know if it's 25% of what we usually it would need for subs for, with the amount of absences we have. So number three, um, impact of new guidance counselor. Again, there's a lot here and I'd like to thank um, Brie Gallagher and Megan O'Neill for helping to put this information together, our two guidance counselors. Um, <clears throat> so the way we're using them this year, I'm gonna kind of summarize. So it used to be Brie was K4 and run and counseling individuals, small groups, and taking care of kids in crisis and all grade levels. <clears throat> and as you know, I mean, even just walking across Pond Cove takes a while. It's so it's such a long um, 
vast school. And so she was servicing kids across the whole school. The way we're doing it now is um, Megan is K-1 and half of two. Bree is half of two and three and four. And so what they've done here is, is they've put to really outlined what they're able to do now. So as you can imagine, um, they're, we're, they're able to, and they've given many examples here, they are able to um, contribute significantly to um, student needs one-on-one, -on -one, small group. They're te both teaching classes in classrooms to all students. Um, they're highly involved in our DEI work in our Peaceful Pond Cove work, all building-wide initiatives. Um, they're really both key players and um, we feel fully implemented now that we have the two. Um, if, you, if you continue down um, that to where it says student served, there's a heading on the next page. So they, can, they did outline some numbers um, that show that you know, they have been, in fact, as you would, as you would think, a, they've been able to really double um, and the need has always been there. And I know when we had one counselor, um, there was just a constant feeling of not being able to do enough, no matter how hard she worked. Um, so we're feeling like this is a really great fit for our school. And it was a, we feel like this was a really good decision um, to add the second counselor. Uh, and again, there's so much information you can read there. I am going to move on from that question. Um, okay, number four, um, class size and staffing. So in my answer, you can see I just addressed, I assumed you meant classroom teachers. And I addressed um, number of students per teacher. And the fact that I think the numbers the numbers look great. Um, they keep us within um, board guidelines and we really are, want to be really protective of our relatively smaller class sizes, especially going into next year. Um, at, at a previous board meeting, we talked about unfinished learning and um, anticipated unfinished learning that we're going to have to make up next year. And so um, these are the class sizes that I would like to see. Um, and I feel like that they are be the most will be the most effective at um, supporting those students. And okay, propose in the increase in fifty three fifty. This is a great question, and I apologize for not um, the increase is is quite significant, and I apologize for not not anticipating that and outlining it last time. Um, so these what what has happened? There's a couple things that's happened. We have um, purchased, I'll just go right down the list. These, the increases from last year include these $7,600. These are for Lucy Calkins reading, writing, and phonics units of study video subscriptions. So the, we, you, we use for our curriculum, we use, um, the Lucy Calkins units of study. Because of COVID, we explored using these videos. These are instructional videos where actually um, someone teaches a lesson. So a teacher can teach the lesson and then the teacher can send this video home of this lesson that has the same lesson that has been taught. And utilizing them through COVID, we, the teachers have realized that they are really beneficial and can really envision using them from here on out. Now, they are yearly subscriptions. Um, so it's not just a one-time purchase. So, because I'm assuming too that they'll continue to update the videos and so it's a yearly subscription. So this is something that I um, worked with my team leaders and through them worked with all, all teachers, grade level teachers, and they felt pretty strongly that they would love to continue to use these um, to support students both in school and at home sometimes. Um, $750 increase in STEM scopes digital subscriptions. So that's, we use STEM scopes as our science curriculum and we let, and we use STEM scopes digital and it's just simply an increase in their price for the per student for their yearly subscription. Um, it's quite a significant increase for one year. Um, it's kind of surprising, but that's the price. Um, usually I would think that, you know, it would just be maybe a hundred dollars more, but it's a lot more. Um, $750 is for DBQ. This is 
um, document-based inquiry, and it's this is something new because we are um, revising our social studies curriculum. And so for grades three and four, our content leaders and working with myself and Kathy decided to utilize DBQ. And so that's, uh, it's $750 for an online subscription for social studies resources to support our new social studies curriculum. And then the biggie is the $14,000. This is Dreambox. So this is, we. I talked about Dreambox last time. This is K4. This is the dynamic um, uh, math app that we are piloting this year. And um, this, this dream box would have been a plan with or without COVID. This was something that was in the works last year. And so this is just in addition to our, our math um, resources so that all students can have another opportunity to practice skills at their level. So when I say dynamic, um, if it would, depending on the level of the child, if they answer questions correctly, it gets more and more challenging. And if it gets too challenging, it backs up on its own. So that is, um, that's the increase. So that is a very significant increase of around 23,000 for, um, 5350. And that's it for me, but I'm happy to answer questions now or later, but thank you. Thank you very much. Very helpful. I just, I mean, this could be just me, but where do we find your written submission? I don't, I didn't see that. Um, oh, I don't know sorry. if that was you distributed to that. us or it's not on the uh, website under the agenda items. Yeah, I was searching everywhere for it and I could Oh my goodness, you should have stopped me. Yeah. It didn't make it on. Yeah, and, and in fact, for that matter, if there's any other written submissions, I don't believe that we would, we receive those from anyone except for Marcy. I don't know if there's a way to distribute those. It'd be good to get those up on the website at some point too for the members of the public. Donna, you're, you're this. muted. Yeah, we'll look those up and find them, get them up there. Okay, great. Yeah, it'd be helpful to get those distributed. Oh, I'm and sorry. I apologize about... to anyone. Yeah. I thought the whole time- I'd love that hard looking... copies too. I'd love hard copies too, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on, and again, it sounds like not, we, none of us got any kind of written materials. So if you have them, um, you can uh, refer to them, I guess, we'll take a look at them later, but, um, but just know that we don't have any materials at this point. So Troy. All right, hi, so I only have a page. You're only missing a page of mine because that's really all I have. Um, so I only have three questions and I think I'll just start with the one that was about related to budget. So the question was, please explain the reason for proposed increase in line 6100 supplies budget. So if you go to that line, you'll see, it's kind of, I think, and Marcy can help me if, if I'm wrong or if I, if I get this wrong, but really it's, it's the same request amount. Um, and what happens is, you know, if, you, if we go over in, in one line, we have to transfer money from another line. No, none of our, none of our um, lines can be run in a negative. Um, so that's really what has happened here. So to make it simple, um, the line 6,100 has no increase from the 2021 budget. It really was $64,044.13. Um, reason it looks different is due to transferring money from 6,100 supplies to 6,400, which was books and periodicals. So if you look on there for 6,400, way over on the right hand side, it looks like a, a negative 13 beside it for the column way to the right. Um, and then the one right below it for $10,000, looks like a negative 68 beside it. If you add those two numbers up and add it to the second column of 49,000, that gets you to your 64,000. So it's, an, it's actually the same exact amount budgeted. It's just sometimes unpredictable you know, those happen to be increases in technology and books and online books and books and periodicals, which would make perfect sense for all the remote learning we're doing. So it's actually not an increase. It's just the way, am I correct? If Marcy, you can jump in if I've got that wrong, but I believe that's the way, why it looks like there is an increase. I think it could look on here, like 
Um, the current budget is 49,000 and I'm asking for 64 when reality is that's where we're at right now because we've moved some money around. Um, so yes. it's actually the same request. Yes, that's correct, Troy. So um, I think that's, I think that helps quite a bit. Um, the next question was, please be prepared to present and talk about class size, teacher load and staffing. So according to the board policy and suggested class sizes, grades five through 12 class sizes should be in the range of 20 to 24 um, in teacher load. So the number, I view that as a number of students teachers are responsible for in a day is 75 to 90. Um, in grade five for next year, um, it look, we'll have six, 114 students, we'll have six teachers per class size of 19 and a teacher load of 95. Um, the 19 is, you know, there's 19 kids in a class and the teachers teach five sections a day. So that's the 95. Um, so we're just one student basically below the recommended 20 to 24 range. Um, and we're just slightly outside of the teacher load of 75 to 90 with 95. Um, sixth grade has 109 students. That's the class that every year has kind of been, there's been a reduction in teachers, just like this year, my fifth grade has five. Next year that group moves and the number of teachers in sixth grade will reduce by one. Now it's not a reduction to the budget because that teacher is gonna move. We have to now get an extra fifth grade teacher back. So um, it's just a movement and reassignment of teachers. Um, nobody's, nobody's leaving, there's not a cost savings there. Um, but so sixth grade next year, 109 students, um, five teachers for a class size of 21.8 and a teacher load of 109. Seventh grade, um, 129 students and seven teachers for a class size of 18 and a teacher load of 92. And eighth grade is 123 students with, again, with seven teachers um, and the class size is 17 and the teacher load is 87.5. Now, why seventh and eighth grade has seven teachers is because we expanded our experiential learning team. So there's actually six regular eighth grade teachers, and then there's an additional eighth grade teacher teaching our experiential learning group. So that is how the seventh, the seven teachers came to be. And in seventh grade, we expanded last year, our experiential learning to, to include seventh grade. So there's a teacher there as well. So that's why um, seventh and eighth grade, the average class size is in the 18.4 or 17.5. Um, and fifth and sixth class size is a little higher. Teacher load, if when you get this paper and you see it, so the teacher load, um, for example, sixth grade has 109 students and that is outside of the teacher load range. Um, some days it's not 109, it depends on like how many kids are going to band that day. And um, some students are pulled out for special services, but that on any given day, <clears throat> those teachers could be responsible for up to 109 students. So I know it's hard without seeing that in front of you, but essentially um, it puts us within all those guidelines and really the only change to staffing is the movement instead of having five in fifth grade, we're now having five teachers in sixth grade. So, um, and when you do get this paper, you'll see um, in seventh and eighth grade, it says the number of teachers is seven. And again, I would just remind you that that's because there's an additional program in seventh and eighth grade, which is experiential learning. Um, and that, that would be why. So when you look at it, if you see that and say, oh, I wonder why there's seven there, that's why, um, because it's additional programming. Um, we, we, just as your policy states, we don't really account for the allied arts classes because the numbers would be way out of whack. Um, Caitlin Ramsey's band class might have 80 kids in it. So that clearly would exceed the teacher load and class size. Um, you know, so that those for those reasons, those are kind of unique and special. Phys ed classes sometimes can have 30 students in them. Um, so the allied arts classes are definitely more unique. And the one thing that is, I always like to remember is all, all allied arts, it's a very general statement to say, but it's pretty accurate. Um, every allied arts teacher will basically see every student in our school at some point through the year or, you know, on a two day a week for the whole year, for example, phys ed. So um, our allied arts classes are, are much more challenging to figure out the number of students and class sizes. And I think it would look really bizarre to somebody if we listed them. So that's why they're not listed there. And then my last question, which is really the biggest one to me, um, 
how will the one-year interventionist position fit into the current intervention structure at CEMS? And I'd like to just start by um, giving you a quick update. We currently have two interventionists working um, at the middle school. And those two interventionists are responsible largely for math, but they also provide some reading and a little bit of writing intervention for students. And they provide actually a significant amount of executive functioning work with students. So they're not solely math, their plate is very full. And this year they are actually being utilized to teach some courses in order to get us so that we could be back in school with the, meet all the minimum guidelines. Um, the next thing I'd really like to do is kind of say what intervention really means in, in our school. Intervention is really targeted instruction to support students as they work to complete their learning. Um, and it's very individualized. So it's something that would be really challenging to teach to a large group, it has to be small groups, preferably four. It would not be uncommon to walk by a room and see six or seven in there. It's just more challenging and less independent, uh, less um, personalized. And then the, really the key is um, intervention is not um, intended to be support for homework. So somebody that's fallen behind in their homework really should not be going in getting intervention help. It's really for um, helping students in developing a specific program that will help them develop their skills so that they can meet the grade level standards. Um, and to, in order to do that, the other real challenge with intervention is to not have it happen in place of their current math class. So if a student is gonna get math intervention, they cannot be pulled out of their current math class, continue to miss those standards and work on other standards. So it has to be in addition to. Um, so that, that is really kind of the, the groundwork that we're working with when we talk about intervention at the middle school is finding blocks of time where that works for kids at the same time without pulling them out of a whole bunch of other things. Um, so so there's kind of a, a little bit of an act balancing act. Now to get more directly to the question of how does it fit into our program Really what we're, if you remember from last week when Kathy, Jason and I presented um, the data from the middle school NWEA, if you remember those little um, towers or those bar graphs that were blue and had the diamond, I think it was an orange diamond and that orange diamond was a predictor of growth. And what we realized in the past was that jump to sixth grade kind of always had a gap but it was typically made up and last, according to the fall to fall testing. So really it was the spring COVID experience was included in that, but not the current COVID, um, anything to do with that. What it really showed was it, in math, um, really none of our grade levels had met that expected growth. Now that does not mean there were not students within there that made it. It just means that overall as a whole, as a class, they didn't make it as an average. Um, so to me, that says that our, our, our needs are, could be great, um, and, or they could be very minimal, but there's a lot more of them. <laughs> so if I miss that by two points or five points or eight points, it's just not making it. And I, I think in the past, kids have to be significantly, uh, have some significant gaps in order to qualify for um, intervention. And I fear that that could be a ball we chase for a long time if we dabble at the attempt of getting it caught up. So. Our goal, my goal, and what I think we're going to do, if this position becomes a reality, is work to reduce the class, use it, so this position would be providing intervention largely in math, and combination with the two existing positions, but I would like to use the two existing positions to provide an extra section of grade level math at each grade. Now, why that is, is because I think there's more than just the targeted kids, I think all kids could benefit from this. And it will, re in the net effect, will be a reduction in class size for math um, for each grade level next year for gra grade level math. Now, I'm not taking into account accelerated students, algebra students, geometry students. They clearly are, are on a good positive path and making growth. So it's really about the grade level math. So fifth grade math, sixth grade math, seventh grade, eighth grade math. So, for example, and I have this written out for the coming year, grade five. The class size for math um, and every and all their other core content areas would be about 19 students per teacher. If I'm able to get this position and add an additional section of regular education math through one of our interventionists, that class size class size would drop to 16. So every math class would drop by four students. 
So to me, that is, that's impacting every student in our school through hiring one person, not just impacting the kids that we target that um, may need the most work. So that's really the approach that, that we wanna take. And if every math class drops by four students in the fifth grade, all of a sudden the one-on-one -on -one attention, the more individualized work um, will definitely be kind of a tier one intervention support right in the classroom. And it may not seem like a lot, but when you think about it, every class, so all of the sections would be four less students. That's a pretty big deal to me and it impacts all students that way um, as opposed to a targeted few. So that's, that's that example. Um, sixth grade would be very similar um, without that position in a more traditional intervention style of just adding an interventionist to targeted students. That would be a 22 would be the class size for students in math. Um, with that position, it would drop to 18. So again, about four students. In seventh grade, um, the average class size would be 21. And with, with the additional interventionist, it would go down to 17. And in eighth grade, it would be 21.25. And with the support, it would drop down to 17. So again, about a four student difference per every grade level math class you walk into. That doesn't seem like a lot if you just look at it as, oh, 17 to 21. And you look at it as a one-to-one -one trade off, but it's actually every class is seeing that reduction in math. So that's really how I would propose to use it. I think it would have the biggest bang for the buck um, and it would require our current two interventionists to continue on and teach one math class per grade level you know, um, next year. So an additional class, but I think that would be a positive um, way of approaching this. And it might allow us to service all kids next year as opposed to um, some targeted few according to NWEA results or, or whatever that might be. Um, and at the same time, it would not be, would not reduce the amount of intensive intervention that we would be able to offer students that were a little further, that had more needs. Um, that will still be able to be there. Um, so that's really my goal. When you do get a copy of my paper, you're going to see, because just because of the way I put it on here, um, I don't want you to be confused. The, the math, this interventionist, when I just said class size in seventh and eighth grade was 21 or 22 without this position. If you look down for the, for, um, the teacher class size and, and ratio, you'll see class sizes of 18 and 17 in seventh and eighth grade math. And I just don't want you to be fooled or think I messed that up. It's because the experiential learning team students do not have math on team. So they go back to their regular seventh and eighth grade classes for that. So experiential learning students go back into their regular with their with their regular math teachers off team for that. So that is why in seventh and eighth grade, the math numbers are slightly higher than they are as just an overall average for the seventh and eighth grade. Um, so I think that's it. That is definitely the way that we would like to move forward with that position. And I feel like it would allow us to impact a lot of a lot more students, practically all students, um, on an everyday basis for the year. And I think we would make great gains. So that is, that's kind of, that's where I'm at. And if you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer them or wait or however you, however you want to do it. Thanks, Troy. Yeah, I think we're going we're gonna to wait and, um, but people are jotting them down and just, you know, apologize again that we didn't get those out, but this is going to give us an opportunity to, I think what we'll do at the next meeting is, um, is actually start with, any more detailed questions now that once the board has a chance to review the written materials. So we'll go through this again, we, but this is a helpful overview um, of that. But once we all have a chance to look at it, we may come back to each of you um, once we you know, review the written materials next week. So we'll start with that next week. Um, but thank you very much, very helpful. And um, now moving on to Jeff Shedd. Hi, so um, I will make sure that you get uh, written materials should be by tomorrow or the next day at the latest, um, depending on when it all gets consolidated. Sorry you didn't get that. Um, I had two questions. Um, the first one is, please talk about how you foresee the one-year math and science support position working, because I've also proposed that a position similar to what uh, Troy and Jason have proposed for one year. A special class offered only next year, extra support in the Achievement Center. Um, so. Basically, what do I see it looking like? Um, 
So I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I will probably be involved in the hiring of this position and some initial thinking about what the position can look like, but I, I won't be here to do the actual implementation. So things could change, but I'll tell you what's on my mind. Um, and first I will say that there are two grade levels that I, I see a position focusing on, and that is ninth grade and 10th grade. Um, uh, 10th grade because our current ninth graders um, in our likelihood will come into next fall not really having had a typical school year experience at Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, and so I think part of their transition to that and filling any, any, any gaps that they may have experienced, uh, they, they, in my mind, will become a focus. And the other grade is the ninth grade. Um, the, and for them, it's really just to help them transition um, to the to high school, um, particularly after a year and a half of um, a, a very different experience in middle school and based on the NWA scores that, that Troy has shared with me and, and talked about again tonight. Um, so I think the grade level focus would be ninth and 10th grade. Um, I think where, where the focus ought to be is in um, on those skills, um, where our kids have tended historically to not be quite as strong. Our math program has always been really strong, but um, it, and generally speaking, our kids tend to master the higher level conceptual skills pretty easily, uh, where we sometimes find they struggle. In, and, and sometimes it's even with some of our higher achieving students. Um, it's, it can be with some of the underlying math skills that, re that really reflect strong number sense or the lack of strong number sense. Um, and the skills that enable students to do math fluently without calculators. Um, not that we are abandoning calculators, they do have an absolute role, but um, there are some skills that are certainly helpful. So the specific skills that I have in my mind are fractions, decimals, percents, proportional thinking, and slope. Um, the one that is most directly relevant they're all directly relevant to both ninth and 10th graders. Uh, the one that's most directly relevant to 10th graders in particular, in particular because it has linkage to chemistry, which is our 10th grade science course is proportional thinking. Um, the other four are, are spread evenly sort of between ninth and 10th grade and our physics, physics class, um, which is our science class for ninth graders. Um, so what I would envision doing is sort of sometime towards the spring of this year, giving the students an assessment to see where they are on some of those underlying mathematical number sense related skills. Um, and then um, I would envision organizing two different kinds of sessions to help kids. One is sort of a three week, two hour per day math free season. Um, that would essentially correspond to our athletic preseason, basically based on how kids have done on an assessment that we give them in the spring, give to all students in the spring. Um, and I think it would be a great, great way for ninth graders, incoming ninth graders in particular, to be introduced to the high school. Um, the other time that I would envision using is, and again, this will um, make more sense for those of you who are parents of high school students or have been parents of, ninth, of high school students is to use the off lab periods in ninth grade physics and chemistry. Um, so the way it works is our physics and chemistry students have labs one day in our four day rotation for one semester per year for half the year. Um, so the other two days of that rotation they are in study hall. Um, but I think it would, it would nicely align students in getting extra math support to what's going on in science and what's going on in math as well if the time was actually grabbed out of um, those off lab days which are otherwise study hall time for students. Um, so the person in the position I would envision would be uh, tracking what students are studying in math and physics and chemistry, depending on what the grade level is, and sort of introducing concepts and uh, to students and reinforcing concepts when they're really important. Actually, I forgot to mention one other. I, I mentioned fractions, decimals, percent, and proportional thinking. I'm not sure I said slope. Slope is the other one, which relates to graphical understanding 
Um, it's huge in, huge in, in physics in particular, chemistry to some extent as well. And obviously in all the math classes that students would be taking in ninth and 10th grade. Um, so that's the way I would envision um, organizing the time. And I would, I would think that if we can hire a, a teacher who's interested in teaching three weeks before school begins in sort of a preseason model, then we could have that teacher end his or her uh, school year three weeks early at the other end. So it's a, they're working essentially a regular school year. So that's the answer to the first question. Um, it's not a final answer. There's lots of conversations still to happen with the math teachers and the science teachers, but that's the way I see, that's the way I, I would see the need. That's the way I would see the time opportunities uh, to plug students into the need um, without taking them away from any of their core classes in any way, shape or form. Um, so that's, that's that question. The second question is um, your new, pos new program or position request forms were not complete. Um, please rank your program and position requests. Um, so my, the reason why they were not complete and that was, that was not an oversight, that was sort of deliberate is because I'm lacking some fundamental information to be able to make me, allow me to make a final determination about that. And that is that we don't have numbers for courses for next year. We don't have student signups for next year yet. We actually are just starting that process this week. Uh, before the budget gets has to get finalized, I should be able to um, give the board exactly where those numbers stand. But but if I make if I operate on the assumption that there will be enough students who sign up to take the new art elective that we've proposed, um, and we have enough students uh, to to take the two additional computer science off, computer programming offerings that we've proposed as well, um, then the order that I would, I would say in terms of priorities are number one, art, that's a one-tenth art position, uh, number two, computer science, and number three, the math science support position. Um, and I would say a silent number four that's there that I have not requested in the budget, but I just wanted to mention it because this is the first year for some of you veteran board members, you'll know that I, every year I've been coming back and asking for a regular ed literacy support teacher position. And for the last several years, I've had to take it out at some point. This year, I didn't even put it in because this other position seemed more pressing. Um, I suspect in the future that position request will come before the board again. But again, assuming we, had a, we would have enough students to justify the addition of the positions, and I think we will, I would say number one, our one-tenth art position, Number two, the four tenths uh, or two fifths computer science position. And number three would be the math and science support position. And I think those are the two questions I had, so. Great, thank you very much, Jeff. Sure. Uh, Del, you're here, Del Peavy. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I'm actually gonna share my screen. Um, okay, so <clears throat> Phil, you're gonna have to give Dell, make Dell a co-host. I already did it in the beginning. Oh, you're good. good. Okay. Uh, it, says, it says I'm disabled right now. Uh, I can do it. Okay. Oh, okay, it says he's a co-host. Should be all set, yeah. One of my new skills tonight is how to make someone a co-host. <laughs> okay, here we go. <gasps> Can you uh, folks see that? Yes. All right. Uh, so my first question uh, was uh, looking at numbers. And I think I probably gave them to you verbally last time. And so the first question was if I could um, put them in written format so that you folks could see them. I will certainly share uh, this uh, very brief PowerPoint with you as well. Um, but this kind of is a rundown of the number of staff that we have in special ed. And of course, keeping in mind that all of these staff members are listed in each of the building administrators reports as well. This is just um, pointing out the ones that work in special education. So our special education teachers, we have 13, our, uh, we have ed techs, uh, we have 24 and they're spread between schools. They're the, re um, the numbers shift from year to year based on student needs. Um, 
speech pathologists, we have 3.5. Occupational therapists, we have two. Physical therapists, we have just 1.4 individual. Uh, the BCBA, the board certified behavior analyst, we have, it's a full-time position, but 40% in special ed and 80% in regular ed. So she works uh, between all three buildings and she's obviously can work with any student within those buildings who may be struggling behaviorally, does not have to be in special ed. Psychologists, we have two. Special education admin assistant, that's Jess over at central office, we have one. Social workers, we have 3.5 throughout the district that work for special ed. We have additional social workers that work for regular education as well. Director of special services, one, and a total staff district-wide are 52. Uh, staff I'm requesting for the upcoming 21-22 school year are 54, and that includes one ed tech three that was already in the budget and kind of slated for last year. And I think I mentioned this at our last meeting that uh, some of the CDS students that were uh, slated to join us uh, did another year with um, Child Development Services, and so they will be with us this coming year. And so that position was left in the budget and uh, will be uh, supporting some of those students. And the other, uh, the other um, position was the 0.5 academic evaluator to fulfill uh, some of the evaluation needs. And the current enrollment, uh, it's cut off on my screen. I don't know if it is on yours, but <laughs> I believe it's a 171. Um, on COVE is 52 students that receive special education services. Middle school is 58. At the high school is 61. And we have one student outplaced at this time. Um, one of the things that was asked is uh, what needs are being addressed and what needs are uh, not being met. Uh, as far as needs, the provision of free and appropriate publication, uh, public education for all students in the least restrictive setting and environment. I add that piece in because um, many of the ed techs, particularly at the elementary level, allow for those students um, to be with their gen ed peers as much as possible. Uh, all teams at all three schools work very hard to do this. Uh, research certainly supports that the more time that they can be with their gen ed peers and learn the skills from those peers, the better off we are. And um, for the most part, whenever possible, we can do, we do that. Uh, many times this, the skill lags that, that are being addressed are too great and do require pull out. Additional support for teachers who have high volume of academic testing to limit the number of uh, intrusions or interruptions of service delivery. And by that, um, the majority of our referrals do come from the elementary level and those elementary teachers uh, not only have to reevaluate their students, current students on their caseload every three years, they get reevaluated, but also the new referrals get divvied up and split between them as well. Um, and then I just mentioned that this would allow for continuity and consistency of all IEP driven services and supports. Um, Unmet needs, there are none listed here because legally I am not allowed to have unmet needs. And so that's why I mentioned that we're meeting the needs of the IEP driven services. Um, there was a question, uh, the third question was around ESY or extended school year services. So extended school year services, some of our students that receive special education uh, demonstrate significant regression whenever there's breaks or interruptions in the specially designed instruction that's being provided. And for those students who um, also have a significant recoupment time, and recoupment time generally takes, it takes more, several weeks to get back what they've lost, those students qualify for what's called extended school year services. And it's uh, determined on a very uh, individual basis from student to student. And that's the IEP teams that determine that. 
and uh, extended school years services are all about maintaining skills, not necessarily about developing new skills. Where does it occur? Um, historically, it's a, uh, the program has been down at the high school. We've had one program um, and um, the different grade levels obviously are broken, broken out. We've been very fortunate that we've had uh, uh, adequate staffing in the past, and I certainly hope that that continues into the future, um, but certainly not the case in uh, some districts. And I just think we're very fortunate that we have dedicated staff that are willing to, obviously this isn't part of their contracts, this is something that they volunteer for. Um, and they do get compensated for it. <laughs> um, and let's see, when does it occur? occur? Generally, it occurs um, right after the 4th of July, and it generally goes for four weeks. It's four days a week, four hours a day. It's in the mornings from 8.30 to 12.30. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's historically what it's been in the past. For this summer, there was a question as to what it might look like this year. I think, um, well, of course, I'm certainly hoping, so last summer, just so everyone knows, uh, it was 100% remote. And so that was extremely difficult, but uh, staff, again, did a wonderful job of um, basically being flexible enough and parents were wonderful as well. And many of the students did well during their summer ESY last year. But this summer, uh, the plan is for somewhat of a more ro robust um, extended school year and that the number of students participating uh, will most likely be a bit higher than they normally would be. Um, and of course, um, what the, exactly the pro programming looks like um, will also be dependent on where we're at with regard to COVID. Um, we certainly try to have social components built into our extended school year. Where some students are slated primarily for academics, such as math and or literacy skills. Other students, maybe it may, the focus may be on social skills. And of course, uh, getting them out in, in the community is one of the goals. And of course, um, it's yet, yet to be seen as to how much community involvement we'll be able to access or provide. And, uh, but hopefully, That'll be part of the programming. And though, and Phil, that was my three questions. Okay, thank, thank you, Dale. And that was helpful to see that up there. Um, okay, I think Noel is, is here and we'll move right on to Noel. Thanks, Phil. Um, I only had one question. It says, when will you be able to answer the question mark with regards to replacing the seventh and eighth grade lap, uh, laptops. Um, basically, we're waiting on information from MILTI, which is a main DOE initiative that's been in the works for quite a long time. It's a really valuable program and they um, survive and they help provide the devices for seventh and eighth grade. Right now, um, it's in um, the, it's called MILTI 2.0. Uh, it's in the RFP stage and I think the RFP stage ends uh, in the first week of March. And after that, um, there's a speculation that we'll know a little bit better uh, the first week in uh, April or the second week of April. So basically, I'm just waiting for that um, decision up to the state. OK, short, thanks. Short, yeah. sweet. Great. Phil? Yes. I'm sorry, but I missed I missed one of my questions. Um, okay. Yeah, let's go back um, to you. So there was one other question on space. Um, what are the workspace challenges that arose during right. COVID? Yeah. Um, so as far as space, the pieces that were arose during COVID, many of our ed techs who during a traditional year may be supporting students in the classroom had to not only do that when the students were in, in person, but also had to um, pipe out uh, instruction remotely. 
So trying to find space for ed techs to be able to do that. Um, I mean, technology was great. We, we were able to get, you know, headsets and um, they got new laptops. And so the technology piece was great, but we still needed um, at least a quiet space for them to be able to do that. And each building administrator has been wonderful in finding those spaces. And I know it's been a, quite a challenge, particularly at Pond Cove, where there wasn't a whole lot of extra spaces to begin with. But uh, I know Jason's been very creative with like sign outs for uh, the spaces that were available. And, you know, so they, they have, they have uh, kind of found their little nooks here and there that they're able to provide instruction and do it effectively. Um, prior to that, I mean, I, overall, I, um, space is, is definitely an issue at all three buildings. Um, the administ building administrators have done a wonderful job of making special ed a priority and that the, there is adequate space for everyone at the buildings. I mean, there has been, you know, and even recently, like in the last year or so, you know, rooms kind of carved up to, you know, where there was open space to try to slide folks in. And uh, I appreciate that. And I know Perry's, Perry's done that in, well, the two I'm thinking of at middle school in Pond Cove, just in the last two years, both of them, you know, they grabbed a little bit of space where uh, they could add additional, um, well, whether it's a tiny conference room or a, a small office space. And um, it's greatly appreciated. The staff that I went through earlier, um, most all of them, you know, they all require space to do their job. And many of them require um, a confidential space to do their job. And so it has been, it has been quite challenging. And again, I, would, I am very thankful to the building administrators who have uh, been very creative in problem solving around this. Thank you. So Thanks for circling back to that, Dale. Yeah, and, and bringing that up. I'm glad, glad you were able to address that. Um, so, Perry. All right, I have two questions. There's a little bit of added questions within the questions, but I'll try to knock it out for you. I apologize. I'm going to read what I typed up earlier as my answers to the questions is to keep me on track and keep from rambling on too much. Uh, please talk about red items or any important projects you are planning on addressing. Why we need to do this work, even if the buildings are, or even if new buildings are on the horizon. Uh, the answer to that is, I noted in the, as noted in the facility needs assessment report. There are three levels of priorities given to the listed items that are needing attention. The items in red would be considered a non-code compliant or life safety concern and are therefore the highest priority. This list here is going to be what we are currently working on or what is planned for the summer or it may have even been, been completed. Uh, the middle school kitchen cooler replacement, it's a walk-in cooler and walk-in freezer that is currently in progress. The cooler is installed and is running. We are just at the point where we need to put the shelving back in, put what food we have back into it and close it up. And uh, tomorrow they'll be installing a sprinkler system within it. And uh, that, uh, that project will then be complete. Uh, high school roof compliancy issue that is part of the SRRF project and is on schedule to be put out a bit out to bid for a second time. Uh, um, I believe in April is what we agreed on, but, but coming shortly. Uh, high school public address system, uh, the replacement of that was completed. The high school metal dust collection system is again an SRRF project up and coming. A high school ventilation system for the welding shop, again an SRRF project. Middle school repairs to the elevator machine room, uh, that is a code compliancy issue, issue and is in the proposed uh, capital improvements budget for 2022, uh, let's see. Installation of new emergency showers and eyewash stations that is scheduled for the spring SRRF project. Improved door security that is in the new capital improvements budget proposed for uh, 2022. Improved security camera surveillance is scheduled for the summer. 
and a middle school, uh, the installation of a, a middle school kitchen hood with fire, fire suppression in the special ed space at the middle school. Those, that's just some of the bigger projects going on right now. Um, there are projects listed in red that are, I would consider a, a sizable project and would need to be done under a larger renovation or building replacement. Um, these are some of the, I'll say medium size and would fall under a capital improvement uh, size budget. I, I did also want to point out that, you know, we frequently, I won't say daily, but weekly, we do run into what I consider um, high priority red projects, uh, emergencies that come up and, uh, you know, they, they rise to the top as well. The, the, li the list is kind of having your car scheduled for uh, a repair because your engine light came on. And what we run into sometimes weekly is, okay, we have that scheduled, we're on our way to the repair, but we got a flat tire on the way. The flat tire now becomes a high priority as well. And that's, that's just kind of what we run into on a daily basis when dealing with the older buildings. My second question, are there any open positions in your department that you have not been able to fill? Are subs available? And what is the impact of this? Uh, we currently have a night custodial position and a night maintenance position open. Uh, the, the trouble hasn't been not being able to find people and I'm hoping that uh, stays the case. It is more of just a not having the time uh, due to the increased challenges of the pandemic, the retirement of Jack, uh, Janet, Pat and Bernie uh, and training of the new staff that took their positions. Um, it's just been flat out busy. And uh, especially with the night maintenance per person, I'm gonna be looking for the kind of the perfect candidate for that position. It's somebody that I need to have full trust in, but also know that they have the skills to carry themselves single-handedly alone at night. Um, that, that will all be coming within the next one or two months um, to finally get those positions filled. Uh, substitutes have always been a challenge at CAPE. Uh, and I believe this, and this is my opinion, but I believe that is due to similar positions uh, that I find in surrounding schools that are also available. So there's, there's a lot for people to pick from that are looking for jobs. Um, I, if you pull up serving schools, you'll find custodial positions littered all over for just about every district. So we're, we're, it's just a competition. Cape's a little further away from everything else. So it's, a, you know, the, the Scarboroughs and South Portland and, and where most of the people live all tend to, I believe, head toward, towards that direction. Uh, and the impact is always a challenge. Uh, Whenever somebody is out, it directly affects the, the remaining crew that is working and usually ends up taking away from some of their normal nightly duties because they share the workload then of the missing staff member. And that's, that's also not just with cleaning, but the custodial staff also does setups and teardowns for your, maybe a sporting event or any type of meeting, anything that's going on. When we have a board meeting back in the buildings, they do those type of things as well. So it's when, when we lose people due to an absence and we don't have anybody to replace them, it affects the whole crew. And that's all I have. Thank you, Perry. Kathy, you're up next. Yes, I am. Thanks, Phil. And good evening, everyone. I have one question, which is um, whether I could explain a bit about the pro proposed increase in the stipend line budgets in uh, all three schools. So that increase in the stipend lines is due first to uh, CBA, the Collective Bargaining Agreement negotiated increases. Um, secondly, um, we are required by the state to provide a peer mentor for all new staff. Um, that stipend is negotiated by the um, Cape Elizabeth Education Educators Association. And um, 
you know, it's hard in December to know um, exactly how many new peer mentors you're going to need. Um, and so we just put three in for each school. Um, so it's really just a, a guesstimate. Um, we can start to refine it as retirement come in. Um, but uh, but that, that was part of that too. Um, and then finally, um, that increase was due to the fact that we um, created um, four new um, K-12 content leader positions. Um, we have in each school, either department chairs or content leaders in the core content areas of um, English, math, science, social studies, and more languages. And what we've been lacking um, is a way to bring together um, the teachers in art and music and uh, library technology, health PE across the three schools. Um, however, since um, I put that in that original quest request budget, I've had a number of conversations with those teachers and think that we can actually meet that need um, that I'd originally anticipated in a different way. So I think we're gonna be withdrawing that, which would be a savings of $6,624. Um, so you'll be getting that when you get um, Marcy's addenda. Um, so that was the one question that I had, but I also thought I would talk about um, a, a second change you're going to see that I, I think that you've been alerted to, and that is, we are proposing a change in the English learner new position request. So originally we had, um, I'd talked with you about converting the 0.5 EL ed tech position to a 0.5 EL te teacher position for a total of 1.5 EL teacher position. Um, after talking with the two EL teachers, um, we have uh, agreed that we would be better able to meet our students' needs if we um, uh, increased one of the 0.5 ELT, EL teacher positions to a full-time position and then reduced the other to a 0.2 and maintained that EL ed tech. Um, the benefit of this is that we would have seven hours of additional support for our English learners. Um, we would have three staff members instead of two, which would provide greater flexibility in meeting our students' needs. Um, and best of all, well, perhaps not best of all, but an additional benefit um, is that the solution would be more cost effective for the district because of the difference in the uh, salary and benefits of the of the various personnel, we would actually realize a, a savings of $3,733 um, uh, if, if we um, adopted that, that change instead of the original one I came to with you. So um, yes, yeah, so I think I've just saved you $10,000 that you weren't expecting. So I'll end right there. Well, that's, that's good news. And um, <laughs> I appreciate that. Looking forward to the addendum on that. Um, thank you, Kathy. Peter, I see Peter here. There he is. Yeah, hi. Um, I just had one question. Please provide the staffing numbers and the location. So um, nutrition staff has 11 employees. We have one assistant director that's full time and myself that's a third time nutrition director. Um, six of the staff work at the Pond Cove and middle school kitchen. And currently I have five at the high school kitchen with actually one of those uh, being a floater in between each um, building. Um, and of those nine and nine employees work over five hours a day. <clears throat> and I have two that are part time. Um, this this year, there's a reduction of two staff from the previous year um, as we had a retirement the previous year and we didn't replace. And then um, we had one leave before the uh, COVID um, hit and uh, we did not replace that person either. So um, that's what we have for our staff. Thanks, very straightforward. And Donna. Uh, so my question is about, let's see, uh, is, 
the first one is, um, is it equitable, reasonable to have a permanent substitute for one school, but not the other? So as you know, when we start working on our first request, uh, original request budget, um, principals put in their request for what they feel are the priorities for um, uh, meeting the needs of their students. So um, Jason put in for a, a permanent sub and the other two principals did not put in for a permanent sub. So that's the story on that. It wasn't that we, um, that everyone felt that they needed a permanent sub. So um, the answer is that um, because it was requested. So um, I, think, I think that's the answer to that. Uh, please talk about a little more about your vision for the uh, director of, uh, technology, and we're now calling that uh, Director of Educational Technology, right, Kathy? Uh, Kathy and I spent some time today working on the uh, job description for this position, which we are going to share with the technology committee that is finally meeting tomorrow. Um, so um, the uh, tech integrators uh, did a little work on that um, and then submitted something, and we took some uh, ideas from some other districts and compiled it today. So um, we are we decided today that we would like to call it the uh, Director of Educational Technology. So really that person would, um, would focus on using technology and education throughout our district, working with the curriculum uh, person, um, person in charge of curriculum, the Director of Teaching and Learning, Kathy, to um, work on the, the curriculum of for technology for technology in the in the district to create a really cohesive and coherent curriculum and that work has been started um, and really needs to be uh, continued um, in order to make a, um, a really cohesive experience from K to 12 in technology and prepare our students for um, going out into into the world what they're what they'll need as an adult. Um, right now, um, as you know, we have the direct, our director of technology, Noel works with, has to work with the town and keep all the systems running in the town as well as the school. And I, I really feel that uh, my vision is that we have a director of educational technology that, that can focus on uh, technology in an educational, uh, with an educational lens. Um, looking at all the programs, uh, the software um, in the schools and kind of coordinating that. Um, so really, really working on um, technology for education um, and uh, looking at the technology program and constantly analyzing it for, I'm trying to think of the things in the, in the um, job description. It's quite a lengthy job description and it will come to you. Um, but I think it's a really good job description. So um, I think as we develop our technology program, Jeff has talked about adding a bit to, um, to one of the teachers uh, time because we know that uh, we really need to strengthen our technology program. So this person would be overseeing that. They would oversee the uh, tech integrators. Um, we would share um, the, uh, the, the guys who keep us running, I'm not sure what their title is, but um, the Connor Jasons and Matthew Youngs, we would share them with the town, continue to share with them with the town and, and our technology integrators would stay in their schools and, and the, um, the director of educational technology would work with the principals in developing programs and doing the supervision and evaluation of those people. It would be a, um, a team, uh, team process for evaluation and supervision of, of, uh, of those, of the technology integrators. So uh, you'll, you'll see more when we, you look at the job description, but it is, it's quite a lengthy job description, but um, I think it will really move us forward um, in the area of technology and, and just make such a better experience for our students. So we're taking the job description to the technology committee tomorrow morning to, um, for their um, for their view uh, and their feedback. 
So more to come on that. Um, hopefully we can get that job description um, to the board by uh, March. Um, so can you explain the increase in the proposed uh, 3000 professional services budget line for the single audit for fe federal grants? And Marcy, um, feel free to jump in here, but um, we, we, um, we received a lot of grant funding this year. Our CRF grants uh, for COVID um, put us over the limit of what you need for a single audit. And we think this will be a one year um, a one year deal, but we will have to have an audit of these grants because we went over $8,500. So um, I don't know, Marcy, if you wanna say anything else about that, but we did make some cuts in some other lines to try to make up for um, the increase in that line. We didn't get it as a flat funding, but um, we did um, get it down to a net increase of uh, $1,295. So, um, do you want to say anything about else about that, Mar Marcy? I think that's good, Donna, and you're correct. It would just be for one year because we don't anticipate going over the threshold of 750,000 in the future. I mean, unless we do, that's great. That'd be awesome. But right now we're thinking it'll just be a one year audit because of the grants that we just received. There were over the, the 750,000. So in regard to sharing costs with the town, and um, this gets a little complicated at times, um, but um, some funds uh, will go to the technology director position. Will the new tech director be able to assume all IT responsibilities of the current tech director? Will the town director continue to, to provide IT infrastructure support uh, that is network support? So Matt and I continue to talk about this and we met some more today to talk about it. Um, we're, uh, we are still working on this, but currently um, our thoughts are again, that we will share the three support positions, which is Matthew, Jason and Connor. So we will split the costs of those um, between the town and the school as we do now, we would keep that exactly um, the same as we do now. Um, the, school uh, the school department, um, Educational Technology Director would oversee the school department website, analyze systems and programs. Um, and he would, that person would be in our budget. Um, the town has, um, they really, Matt really hasn't formalized his plans about what he's going to do. He has a couple different ideas, um, but the town would, um, that would be in the town budget. Um, the, the director of educational technology would not be supporting uh, the town systems. For example, the fire department, the, the uh, technology for the fire department, the technology for uh, the police department, those things. That person would only be working uh, with the school department um, technology. So I think I covered everything for that question. Yeah, so that person would would own, would be doing infrastructure support, but with for the schools and not for the town. Uh, relief funding: If there's additional COVID relief funding during the school year, um, have the needs been identified, and is there a plan for how it can be used? We are waiting for additional COVID relief funding. Um, I just heard on the radio today that that bill is being worked on. Um, so we have no answers to that. So we can't count on that. Um, two of the math support positions um, that you heard, the one at the high school and the one at the middle school are one year positions. And I'm thinking that if we hear about COVID funding before, um, before those positions are uh, technically in the budget, that we could use, apply that money to fund those positions and that would uh, lower our, our budget. Um, in the past with the, uh, with the COVID money, you could not use it for anything that's in the budget. So there's gonna be a race between whether we hear from the COVID, from uh, 
about more money from COVID or whether we actually have to put those positions in the budget. And if we actually have to put those positions in the budget, then we can't use uh, COVID money to fund them. So um, I'm hoping that we will hear that we're getting more money and that would reduce our budget by two positions. Um, and because there, I feel comfortable, usually I don't like to put uh, use grant money, they call it the cliff because you get used to having that person and then um, it's hard to put them in your uh, local budget. But knowing that those are one year positions or going in with a thought that they're one year positions, I feel comfortable doing that. Um, so we will have to wait and see on that. Um, otherwise, um, we can always find ways to, um, to use that extra funding and Marcy and I pretty creative in that. So um, if, we, if we do happen to get um, extra or additional uh, COVID relief fund funding, we would be happy to come up with an application and apply for that funding. So, and I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, Marcy. Thank you, Phil. So um, I thought I would respond probably to the questions directly um, in reference to the audit, the checks and balances for our accounting procedures and the audit controls for the activity funds. So um, in our audit report, it is mentioned that we are a small operation. And, and even though we are a small operation, we still try to maintain the checks and balances as much as possible in the areas of accounts receivable, accounts payable, and payroll. And luckily, we don't have a lot of contact with accounts receivable um, cash in our office. And when we do, we have the checks and balances in place where two signatures are required when we, when we receive the money. And we have the town finance director now who then takes our deposits and verifies our receipt of the money as well. So then he is in charge of uh, making sure that the bank reconciliation takes place and the money is deposited. Uh, payroll actually is audited by human resources manager, um, our payroll coordinator, and then I'm also overseeing the operations. So that's how payroll is monitored. And with accounts payable, um, this is a critical operation to make sure we have not only the authorization on the purchase orders, but I make sure at this point in time that we have two signatures from the department director and then I sign off. And then we have our school board signatures as well. So um, that's a huge area that the auditors pay attention to in the accounts payable side. So that's critical for our checks and balances to make sure that any check request or any, any check, any disbursement going out is signed by at least two people in our office and then reviewed so that my work is then reviewed by our governing board. And then the audit controls for the activity funds. Um, we have the, uh, the two items that come up consistently. And the first item is the use of gift cards. The second item is timeliness of deposits so we are trying to aim for a perfect report next year. That's our goal. Um, and we will see it. I'm determined that we'll see it. It's hard with activity funds. And anyone can tell you that activity funds are a hotbed for um, problems with, with, with audits. So if we can keep getting these down to next year at the most one comment and the following year zero, that's our goal. That's my target. And um, I've been in communication with our administrative assistants from the three schools. And uh, at last year, it was last January that I met with them. This year, I've been in contact with them and we are having a Zoom meeting next week. And we're making a commitment to um, have an initial meeting next week to discuss the fact that the use of gift cards is a sacrifice or the re removing the use of gift cards is a sacrifice, but we're gonna talk about that and why. And we're gonna do that in person and go over, go over how that impacts the overall financial uh, situation for the school and just giving a global picture of that. And then the timeliness of deposits, um, I've explained to our admin assistants that I'm always available. And also our finance director for the town has said that we can make sure that they can drop deposits off at town hall. That way we can have a timely deposit every day 
that's my goal has always been every day when it comes to activity funds that money is in the bank by the 24 hour period. So we now have two options that we're gonna to propose to the admin assistants. And we're gonna talk about that next week and then um, have more frequent um, time to touch base about this so that we can kind of get this in the right direction for Cape Elizabeth. And like I said, it's an ambitious goal and I know it's bold, but we can do it. And so what else would you like me to, to address with that, Phil? The two questions and then the packet of information that I provided this afternoon is um, these are really dense subjects, really intense things that I know that are coming up in the future. And I, as um, Donna had mentioned, all of the subjects that we have scheduled, I can go into detail next week and then whatever other nights that we have scheduled. Specifically, our fund balance report, our um, audited fund balance report, our nutrition services deficit um, situation and our options with that. Uh, the packet has a graph of the fund balance trend. So we'll talk about that in more detail. I, I picked a few years that I think that we would want to strive for with the trend of the use, the percentage use of fund balance during a period of five years. So I think that we could talk about that at our next meeting in depth. And it's this, it's, I love this subject, but I know this could be overwhelming for everyone in one night. So you guys can decide how many nights you want this divided out. And the ED279 is another one of our favorite subjects. I love that one. And in that, um, I was asked to give uh, history. So I've, what I've done is in your packet, you have a history of by itself, the state subsidy for uh, 10 years, E279 report. And then I also wanted to include, I thought it would be interesting. I think um, one of the questions was to provide a school funding comparison history report. So I thought it would be interesting for us to see just how much um, over the years for property taxes versus the state subsidy versus fund balance used. So that gives you a picture of, of how committed the community is in making sure the um, excellence of Cape Elizabeth schools continue. And then the final chart I have is showing the fixed cost graph, the pie chart. And we can go over that too in another night as well. And it shows our, our largest chunk, of course, goes to salaries and benefits and um, contractual salaries and benefits. So it's a, it's a thick packet. And at any point in time, um, be, in between the times that we go into diving deep into these, you can feel free to call me with your questions. If you see something that looks funny or if you want more information, um, I'm here to, to talk about it. And you'll have to probably t put a time limit on me and how much I'll start talking about it. So what else do you think you would like to hear from me tonight, Phil? Well, thank you. I know you were going to go into more detail next week, and that's probably why. Yeah. Um, so this, and you, and you did um, center around this tonight. So you know, board members could have questions. We're going to open up to questions here in a minute, um, or wait till next week. But next week, just so you can maybe preview for next week um, the two big topics that you'd like to go into, because I just because they may uh, they may uh, influence whether people have questions now or what they want to wait. But I think you had mentioned to me. We're going to go into a little more detail on the school funding formula itself and the and the ED uh, 279 form 279 yep. form, yep. Um, and then also our fund balance issues. You're going to tackle those separately next week. The fund balance and our options for using the fund balance on the building projects. Is that right? Yes. Next week. That's okay. Correct, Phil. Yes, that's going to be a big decision for everyone. Um, is the use of the fund balance as we move forward with the total amount of expenditures, and that's why I did that. Uh, trending the forecast and of the percentages used in the past, kind of in the middle of the last 10 years or so to maintain a healthy fund balance and what, what I think we would wanna to work towards. And I think that we could just start thinking in terms of what kind of decision you wanna make um, in the use of the fund balance. So that's why I added the chart showing the, the average percentage used during the time that was a really healthy maintenance of fund balance before you got hit really hard with that loss of state subsidy where things got tough. And so um, 
right now we have budgeted a 39% use of our fund balance, just to give you that perspective. So you have the option to increase that use and we'll dive into that deeper next week if you like, um, just start thinking about it food for thought. Um, but the unassigned fund balance is um, enough right now that you can start thinking in, in terms of using the 600,000 that I have just as a placeholder for now, or if you would like to be more comfortable in taking that down even more, or if you would like to increase it. And what I could do for next week is um, play around with the numbers in terms of how it affects your percentage. So I think that's what I'll do for our time next week. I'll put together a little chart of what it would show if you decrease the existing expenditure, the existing fund balance amount with the expenditures the way they are. And I'll compare that to what we have in the budget at 600,000 for fund balance and what it would look like if you went up a little higher. So um, does that, I think that would be helpful. That would be helpful. Yeah. And, and you may get into this next week, but there is there a um, sort of best practice recommended percentage to keep your fund balance? Well, there's definitely one yeah. thing that we have to keep in mind that the state would require us um, to not have over 3%. 3% of our operating budget right now would be 854,000. The state would require that over three years, we would have to make sure we have it under that amount of 854,000. So we know for sure we can't keep an unassigned fund balance in excess of 3% of our overall budget. So that we know for sure. If you look at a, a comfortable position um, over time, it's, it's a good idea to have um, at least, in my opinion, and this, this can vary, and you guys can have a different opinion of this too, because this is, this is definitely your decision to make, but a nice healthy fund balance in reserve of at least three to 500,000 is a nice plan in case state subsidy drops in the future. But again, this is completely something that you all will wanna think about, um, you know, and collectively, individually um, to think about for the, for the future. Uh, now that we have an opportunity to have this fund balance in a situation where you can either use it or uh, maintain a, a healthy portion of it for the future, just to be safe. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good position right now for you to be in to think about which way you wanna go with it. In addition to this, what you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about in the back of your head too for the next few weeks is the issue of the nutrition services deficit that comes into play with our fund balance use. Right now, the reason why I picked 600,000 was because, and cut me off, Phil, at any time, okay? Just cut me off. Yeah, no, this is fine. We, have, we still have some minutes here. Okay, because I'll keep rambling. Um, this is helpful to get us ready for questions for next, yeah, for me, at least for next week. Yeah. What you, yeah. Right. Basically, I budgeted the 600000 with the thought process that it would cover the concept design fee for the architects and engineers if you approve that process. And it would cover the nutrition services deficit of almost 300000 that was, the, that was the thinking behind it. But you do not have to fully fund the deficit in one year. The auditors will allow you to spread the deficit over three years. The state is asking us to pay off nutrition service deficits. So we're kind of in between. So start thinking about that. We're, we're kind of in a poll here. The state wants us to pay off the deficits um, the auditors will allow us to carry the deficit, but at the same time, I also want to emphasize that when we carry a deficit, we are also, the reality is that um, the costs of the nutrition services programs are, um, they're, are costly with, with the way things go with salaries, and our, and our program is doing far better than, than our surrounding areas. So we have, we're in an excellent position with, with what it's costing us. But the reality is that it is going to continue to cost us some money. So 
right now, I'm hoping that our, our deficit for the end of this year will be in the 50 to $80,000 range. And that's something to think about. So we're kind of chasing the deficit until we can get it to a funding level, which I believe would be a little higher than what we're doing right now. Right now we're at $100,000 a year funding level. So it's kind of something to think about too in a, in a really serious way of how we want to approach this. Sure. Does that make sense? I know you guys will have a lot of questions about this and that it's going to yes. take a lot of talking. But no, and that's what we do. We do, we do yeah, a, lot right, of a lot of talking. And I know I th I'm not <laughs> throwing a lot at you guys right now. I'm throwing a lot of numbers. It's, it's great. No, and actually I'm starting to have a number of questions, but before I do, because I can yeah. probably ask a number of questions in a row, I'm going to actually ask the board if they have questions first. We have 25 minutes we can use up um, tonight, um, or we can, or if you, you prefer to think this through and digest it and see the written materials, you can ask later. But I do want to open up the opportunity. If you want to maybe raise your hand to keep it a little bit organized, if anyone has a question of any of the administrators at this point, this is the general question time. We, we might not. Well, I, I just have, I have one, which, um, and I think we may have talked about it a bit last time, but this is going to be helpful for us, I think, to tee us up on this conversation about the fund balance and the nutritional services, and I think it'd be helpful just to get a little more background. I mean, I've only been on for a year about the nutritional services deficit issue, mm -hmm. and that may be too much for you to answer tonight, and if it is, that just let me know. You, we can prepare for next week, but whether it's you, Marcy, or Donna, or if it's, or, or if it's Peter, but just to... I'd like to sort of know how that happens. You know, what's the cause of it? It sounds like we are doing better than other districts, but it's it seems like it's a systemic problem. Um, and how, and this is just a question I've heard sort of just even on the news. So obviously we all know that, that we had COVID funding for school lunches, but that doesn't seem to fully affect, there's still a deficit. So I, I just get a little a better understanding of that. Um, and then maybe we can get into how to address it going forward. Um. I'd, I'd like to make one comment about that too, if you guys don't mind me jumping in on the, um, the COVID funding, unfortunately, hasn't helped us in the area of salaries and wages for nutrition services. What I'm hoping, my, my hope is this next round, Donna, I don't know, maybe you'll hear something too. They will hopefully let us have an opportunity to offset some of the costs that we are facing. Is, is bottom line, um, and Peter, I, he might be still on here. Peter, you can help me with this, but it's it's the cost of salaries and wages, and um, it's it's across the country, from what I right. Can I mean, right here. one of the things that I can talk about right now is like um, a month ago, Falmouth was over five hundred thousand mm dollars -hmm. in, in debt. So um, with our our salaries and wages, obviously, I can't control that. I've obviously um, put myself down to a third time and eliminated two positions so my staffing is down but our numbers are down so um fortunately we were able to get our waivers and get our subsidies so we are getting some revenue but we're not getting any other revenue whatsoever from any other food purchases or catering or anything that we've are, are always done um and one of the things <clears throat> with the deficit this is built up over time and I mean, this is something that is, has been years in the making because like Marcy said, the state has, has said that they're supposed to pay the deficit off over, over the end of the year. That has not been done in several years. Um, and also over the audits over the past several years, I mean, for the first, I believe eight years I was there, we ended up with a surplus, but then as salaries had, had gone up, and there was never a budget that was in place for me. So there was no money that was ever set aside. It was always like I, I tried to make even. So what has happened over the course of the years is I have all, almost all of the employees that I have have been there for 15 plus years. And obviously their pay is a lot higher than other surrounding districts. So you know, I'm, I'm kind of in a catch 22. I have great people that are experienced, but I also have high salaries. And obviously, um, 
you know, we, we are very good at what we do and we put out a great program, but there's also a cost that's involved in it and we try to keep the cost down. So there was never any subsidy that was involved in our lunch prices. So um, with, with the town. So for years past, there's never been any money that's been put in only to offset once in a while. And then obviously we've had some, some other things where things may have been, um, you know, we've had some changes at that business manager and stuff. So um, with Marcy and I, we've really dug deep into this whole thing and gone through the whole process. And I mean, we're pretty, we're pretty um, confident that we're going to end up being a lot closer. And like Marcy said, and we're in a lot better position. I mean, mm -hmm. 50 and 80 thousand is minimal compared to three quarters of a million dollars for Falmouth that they're expected to be at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And obviously we, you know, we're doing with, with less, less staff. We have 11 staff members and we're serving close to 10,000 meals a month. So, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. Costs are up, salaries are up. Like I said, it's a catch 22. We have great people, but they cost a lot of money too. Um, and then we've had situations where we've had to replace equipment where we really didn't have budgeted money for it. So that was created also the deficit because there was equipment and um, repairs that were never budgeted for. So basically it just came out of what our food sales were. So in the end, we, we had no money. So it looked like we were in the deficit. We also have negative student accounts upwards of $30,000 that we haven't been able to recoup. And the previous administration did not want to um, send out, you know, to collections or anything like that. That's another bit of information that we've tried to, um, that we've never really put to the forefront. So, you know, you think about mm -hmm. that, that's a $30,000 deficit that we're carrying that really should be a, a debit to our account. So, yeah. That's just my, and, my thought and on we that, were, Marcy, if you want thank to. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And thank you, Peter. I wanted to mention that we were able to use the COVID grant money to enhance and support Peter's operation with some equipment. We got some new, we were able to purchase a new dishwasher, uh, tilt pan, which I'm not sure what that is exactly, but I know it's very critical to the operation for the remote um, hybrid yes. uh, meals that go out in the operation at the high mm -hmm. school. And then we were able to um, provide all the packaging materials for the, re, um, the hybrid meals as well through the grant. So that helped tremendously. And, and I think it's going to help at our bottom line by the end of the year. And I, 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 mean, I believe we weren't allowed to use the COVID money for salaries and benefits because that, no. was, in, like, that was already in the budget. So. Right. No, right. And, and then that's another thing with this year, obviously, um, our labor numbers, I mean, because I could have said right now that I had four part-time people, but as, as of this year, um, those people have been working more hours because of the way we have to serve lunch, so. Right. Okay, well, thank you guys. That's that's very helpful for me to understand that. Well, I'm sure we'll get into it a little more next week when we talk about the fund balance. Sure. It's intersection, absolutely. Fund balance. Yes, we definitely. do have a couple questions. Um, uh, Kimberly, and then, and then Cindy. Thank you, Phil. Um, I had a question for Troy and maybe um, a like um, Jason Troy combination question, but I don't know if you wanted to kind of hold those questions for next week and focus on the nutrition stuff. No, more go ahead. Week. Okay, go ahead. It, and All if right. people don't know the answers, though, they can always come back next week. With okay, the answers. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, that that's perfectly fine for me. Um, okay, so I. Um, I appreciate all your presentations tonight. Thank you very much for, for getting the answers to our questions. Um, Troy, I really appreciate the, your uh, proactive approach to um, trying to mitigate um, academic loss in the math area with the interventionist next year. And I just wondered, I, I think I heard you say that it was only gonna be at grade level math, not, um, not if kids are, I don't, I, I don't even, I totally lost track of the various math in the middle school, but um, I'm wondering um, while those kids, 
maybe have been doing well if they're at an upper level map, if they are perhaps also losing content area this year. Um, is there any plan to address that? Um, perhaps not with this interventionist, but. So that's a good question. Um, and I think the interventionist is slightly separate from that because we're really talking about getting kids that have not currently mastered grade level standards, not as concerned about students that have not mastered a grade level or two standards above where they currently are working. So I think the priority is to get everybody through the grade level standards first. So that would be the goal for the interventionist. Um, I think there's two ways of, two things that are happening for the, to meet the needs of the kids that you're talking about, um, Kimberly. And one is the spiraling work in, in the vertical alignment really of our math programming. So for example, our, if I have an eighth grader in algebra and um, they may not have covered it maybe or mastered, I think it's fair to say they're being introduced to the concepts um, but I'm not sure that it, it's at the same mastery level of maybe a more typical year. Um, everybody's aware of that. So for example, my math team talks with the high school math department and they identify those areas that they're thinking are gonna take some refresher time. Um, I actually love Jeff's idea because I, I think that kind of early kickoff to the school would be, would be very helpful for, for many of our kids. Um, but so some of it has to do with communication, vertical alignment and talking about standards. There is gonna be a little bit of a challenge if I'm an algebra one student now, there's that class called geometry in the middle before the algebra two thing hits. Um, and then the gaps from algebra one could show up. So this is not gonna be a one year necessarily, one year set it and forget it kind of fix for them. I think it's gonna to have to take a couple of years for kids to go through that process. And it's really gonna count on the communication we have. The other way I think of supporting those students um, is obviously through our Ascend math program, which we've kind of started to ramp up a little bit the usage of this week, starting to have some expectation of everybody doing it. The challenge is I don't wanna grade it. I don't want it to become that extra pressure on students. However, we all know things that are not graded are not necessarily on the top of people's list to do. Um, so, but that is an opportunity to fill and build some of those gaps that um, Jeff was talking about um, because students will get that extra practice and time to do that. We will also be able to see the standards they have mastered and haven't. So then we could target them for the summer if we wanted to say, hey, you've, you've completed the expectations in algebra, but these are some things that would really help you moving forward. They still have access to that program. So essentially a personal tutor um, over the summer. And I believe that we can kind of design a program that would fit their needs and, and identify the standards for them to work on. So slightly different approach. Um, doesn't really deal with the interventionists right now, but that's kind of the path forward that I can see for those. Does that help? Yes, that, that's very useful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then my second question, um, it goes back to the, I, I think Ascend is what you called it, and, and Jason mentioned Dreambox, and I believe the intention is to maybe eventually go forward with one or the other, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that, but um, but could we anticipate then, I think Jason said it was a $14,000 subscription cost for Dreambox. Um, would that be a, a cost that would cover the middle school as well if we went with Dreambox or, or if we went with the Send, or is there an additional cost for each school yeah, so I kind of bargain with the send person, you know, we kind of barter back and forth and I try to, you know, there's a benefit for these companies to say they're working with Cape Elizabeth. Um, so I use that every chance I get. Um, but essentially, um, I think ours for a send issue was $6,000 for everybody to, all my, every student to have it all, and it goes through the summer. Um, part of the challenge for me with Dreambox is it's a K-8 program, I believe. Um, and I have many students, I believe Ascend will go up through maybe Trig. Um, so it can, I think, I think it can be more useful for the middle school than the current version of Dreambox. Now I've only set through one Dreambox presentation, so I could be totally wrong on that, but I believe it's a K-8 program. So I think, it, I think we have many students that would limit out. Um, and I would rather have something that would impact and help and support all of our kids. So um, that's, that's my answer. I don't know what Jason, knows or thinks about that but we're we're definitely in the stage 
I think pre-pandemic, the need for that was less, honestly. Um, and my goal would be to get back to those areas. Um, and I think we could use fewer licenses. I don't think there's a need for everybody to have that all the time um, because our students do very well in a, in a typical year. Sure, and so to address the dream box, like I don't believe, um, and Kathy can chime in too, uh, um, if, if she'd like, but I don't believe there was ever an intent for the elementary to use Ascend or even, I'm not even sure how low it goes in the grade levels. Do you know that, Kathy? Well, I think Troy told us that it starts in the element at the elementary school. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, if we if we ended up deciding that we want, and we talked when we presented at the last meeting that we were going to look at both programs next year, and we wanted the opportunity to use them in a quote unquote normal school year and then evaluate them. And um, I mean, you generally do get economies of scale when you um, have a program in, um, in multiple schools. And, um, and, and I, think we, I think we've all become, uh, to Troy's point, skilled negotiators. And we, 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 uh, we, we do bargain with, with these vendors. So, um, so we're at the high school and geez, middle school's really interested. And what can you do for us? And um, so, um, but I, on, you know, I think we want to, we want to pick a program that's best for kids. And it may be that Dreambox is best for our elementary school age students and Ascend is best for our middle school age students. And I think we have to be prepared for that, but, uh, but we're not, we're going to have an open mind. We're going to, we're going to um, implement both next year and, and then we'll see where we're at. And, yeah, and really quickly, I would just add, I, it's really important to me to remember that we're not talking about a program to replace classroom instruction. Um, you know, so it's really about finding something that supports the classroom instruction. Um, so I think that makes the necessity of having a, some continuity in programming less important, in my opinion, because it's not the, to me, it would never become our curriculum and it's not going to replace the teaching. It's much more about individualized support for students and access, so... Yeah. This is also where um, a director of educational technology might step in and do some research on um, some programs and uh, what's worked well, um, you know, for students uh, nationwide and, and uh, in nearby districts. And um, so that would be another um, responsibility of that director of educational technology to work with, with the principals in, um, and the curriculum, uh, the director of teaching and learning to, um, to research those programs and select those programs. Thank, thank you all so much. Um, and my final, um, I don't know if it's question or request, um, but in the, um, I don't know, a couple of years ago, we instituted sort of a consistent um, evaluation for new programs that are implemented to go back. And, and I wondered if we have something like that, um, I, I, you know, maybe, I don't know, along the lines of um, subscriptions or, or things like that, that we're adding in that are not necessarily a new hire or, or a new program, but something um, just so that we're not, so that we're looking back at things that we've added into the budget and, and truly evaluating if we want to continue to have them in or if we're just hitting repeat. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, Cindy. Hi, thanks, Bill. Um, I have a question for Dell. Um, and I'm wondering if you have been able to receive all, or if you've been able, if we've been able to deliver all the required IEP service hours this year, and do you need, anticipate any need to provide of compensatory services next year due to students who may not have been able to access support during remote and hybrid learning. Um, so we are fulfilling uh, IEPs um, in their entirety. And um, that has been the plan since, since we got back in September. And if there have been students that um, were struggling with regard to that, uh, I think I've mentioned to the board that we have many students that are coming in all four days 
to receive those services and again to fulfill those IEP obligations. Um, the 100% remote students um, um, that are is based on parent choice is uh, a little bit more challenging, but of course we're doing everything we can to again fulfill those IEPs to uh, in their entirety. And was there a second part to your question? I'm sorry, Cindy. Well, that that was mainly it. I, I said, would you anticipate any need to provide compensatory services next year uh, and we'll, to students and we'll, that might not have had full delivery this year? So there will be, um, you know, and again, on an individual basis, there'll be conversations with uh, families. If, um, as we get to that point that um, uh, case managers are sharing that certain students, regardless of the efforts that were made, still were unable to um, have a meaningful benefit from the instruction that was being provided, then we would certainly be discussing uh, compensatory services at that time, or, or uh, probably the term I would use is COVID impact services. And that, and you know, my question, Lisa, obviously, what, is that considered in the budget for next year, the potential to have to provide that? So um, I had mentioned that uh, the plan is for uh, most likely a more robust ESY. And so I have been doing my best to um, make sure the funding's there in place for that. Um, there are, I mean, as, as I noted that there was a slight uh, increase in the budget line for ESY for the upcoming mm -hmm. school year. Um, and um, then um, also grant money um, is being set aside as well to, uh, to meet those needs as well. Right. Great question. Thank you. Great, great question, Cindy. Thank you. I think that's it at this point. If there are last chance for board members. Oh, we do have a Jen. And it can probably wait until next week. Um, Marcy, regarding the um, fund deficit, I'm trying to think of this and not in terms of car loans, but is there any sort of interest that we carry if we don't pay off that fund, the food service fund deficit within the one year? So any other additional funds that would be tacked onto that? Good question, Jen. Um, no, uh, luckily not in this case. Um, again, with that, it, it ultimately impacts the overall fund and cash balance position for the, at the town level, less interest earnings overall. It, ours is separated, of course, from the town. But if you look at it globally, overall, the earnings cash balance wise, but um, no penalty for any interest charge for carrying the deficit. Good. All right. Well, I think that's it for tonight, we'll continue this conversation. I wanna thank everybody for participating and for all the work that you put into this. As usual, it's great to work with people who are so thoughtful and who come so prepared for these kinds of questions for us. It makes our job easier. Um, so we'll look forward to talking to you next week. I think just to, as a preview that I, I already previewed it, but um, because we're gonna look at some written materials, we may, we may do a first quick round again around the administrators. Um, and we'll start with that, and then we'll go into um, Marcy's more in-depth presentations uh, on the fund balance issues and the um, school funding formula issues. And so with that, um, have a good evening. See everybody. Okay.